Hello everyone, it's Professor Rako here. Uh, this is our last uh, video in the long-term liability chapter. And what we're doing here is just another example of uh, the early extinguishment of debt or retirement of debt, whatever uh, you want to call it. So we did the last video. If you want to go back and look through that, it was another example. This one's a little bit uh, tougher. You have to think through a lot of things, but it, I like this one because it kind of pulls some other parts of the chapter into play here. All right, so we got a company. It says the long-term debt section of the company's balance sheet as of 12-31-06 included 9% bonds payable of 200000 less unamortized uh, discount of 16000 Okay, uh, The bonds were issued to yield 10%. Uh, and they use the effective interest method. Okay, so that's important. The last one we looked at, they use straight line. Okay, so that means our numbers, you know, need to, in theory, need to come from an effective interest table, which we don't have before. So we'll have to think through that. Uh, interest is paid semi-annually. All right, so notice we're jumping ahead to July 1st, 07. All right, so meaning uh, we're going to retire the bonds at 103, but we also have an interest date on July 1st. Now this January 1 date would have been captured with the 123106 numbers because we would have accrued those up to that point. So we're good there, but we need to account for July 1 interest and then retire the bonds, meaning we're going to have to catch everything up to July 1st. All right. So it says prepare the journal trees to record the 70, I'm sorry, July 1st payment of interest, uh, including the amortization of the discount and then the early retirement of the debt. All right, so let's just take this into two parts. All right, so it wants first, July 1st, 07. It wants the journal entry for the interest, okay? Because we're going to have to pay that interest up to that point. All right, so before we even think about the numbers, let's just remember if the bonds were issued at a discount, so my journal entry, when I'm paying interest and recording interest expense, is going to look like this. All right, so we can go and calculate the cash. Remember, the cash is the interest payment where we use the stated rate. All right, so it says uh, we have 200000 worth of bonds payable. And we have uh, 9%. Actually, let me just do this down here where we can see it a little better. So we have 200000 So this is the interest payment. It's 200000 times uh, 9%. <laughs> times six twelfths because it's interest paid semi-annually. All right, so that works out to be 9,000, all right? So if you think about it, if you go back to uh, our amortization tables, this was column A. I always had the headers up there, A, B, and C for the journal entry, all right? So we know that 9,000 is my cash number in the journal entry, all right? The next thing we need to figure out is what is the interest expense number? Now, when we're doing an amortization table, interest expense was, you know, column B, uh, and, but we don't have an amortization table set up. So here's where you really need to think through and use, uh, you know, usually students have a pretty good idea of how to handle the amortization table. So use that to your advantage, right? So how do we get interest expense? Okay, well, just think of the formula. Beginning of the period, carrying value, times the market rate. All right, <clears throat> so let's think through that. We don't have an amortization table, but we do know the beginning of the period carrying value. Because remember, the beginning of the period carrying value is face value, which is given, less an unamortized discount, which is also given. All right, the market rate is 10%. So remember, the semi annual market rate is 5 So we can still do this, but even though we don't have an amortization table set up. All right. So if you work that through, you get 9,200. All right, so make sure you're clear on this because this is where a lot of students would get tricked up. They're like, well, we don't have an amortization table. How can we possibly do that? We don't know when the bonds were issued, so we can't go back and create an amortization table. But we don't have to do that. As long as we knew these two numbers, the 200,000 and the 16, that gives us the beginning of the period carrying value. So don't forget that formula. Face value, less than unamortized discount. Right, so that's 9,200. Like I said, that would have been column B. And then remember, our uh, amortization amount is just the difference between those two. So it would be 200, and that would be column C. All right, so we can put the 200 here and the 9,200 here, and then we're caught up. <clears throat> Another way I think I'm going to scroll back up to the top and write this out. 
So a lot of times students feel pretty good about the amortization tables. All right, so if you think about if we had an amortization table, we'd have a column for 1107, okay? And then we would have the uh, 7107. All right, so we know that the int column A is 9,000 every single time. That's the payment. We don't know the interest expense there. We don't know the amortization there. But we do, knew, do know the unamortized balance is that, and the carrying value is that, because that was given in the information. Because remember, this 184 is the 200 less the 16. All right. Now, if you think of it this terms, then I could take the 184 times the 5%, get 9,200. This gives me 200 here. And then this updates this to 15,8 and 184,2. All right. It's important to know that these two numbers here because remember, when na the next part of this problem is the retirement uh, calculation, all right, where we compare the reacquisition price to the net carrying value. Well, when we do net carrying value, we need to know the unamortized discount that's going to give us that. So you're going to see these numbers uh, when I do the calculation. However, I already know these now so if I would have set it up this way. So it's just a couple of different ways to look at it. So let's scroll back down and we'll come here and do the calculation for the reacquisition price compared to the carrying value, all right? So it tells us in the problem, we have retired them at 103, all right? So my reacquisition price is 206. The, uh, <clears throat> we compare that to the net carrying value. Remember that is face value, which is 200,000 less the unamortized discount, which is uh, 15.8. <clears throat> so think about it. I, I, I could have done that two ways, all right? I could have just, if I didn't do the amortization table up here, now up here I've got the 15.8 right here, so I know that. If I didn't set it up that way, I would have said, well, my beginning is 16, and I just amortized 200 right here. So that means 16 and amortized 200 more brings my balance to 15.8. Okay. So I could have set up a T account or something like that and had that 15.8 come from there as well. So whatever, which way, whichever way you want to do it, uh, you're going to get the same answer. All right. So that gives me on a net carrying value. That's an E. The carrying value uh, is 184.2. Once again, up at the top of the page, I already knew that. But so depending, uh, but I didn't necessarily have to do that to get that number. All right, the reacquisition price is more, so it's going to be a loss of 21.8. All right, so if you know, if you go back and watch the previous video, you notice I did this same setup uh, to get my loss on the previous uh, video. So, you know, I, I like to do things the same way every time. So when it comes test time, I can remember it. All right, so this is also happening on 7107. We've got the bonds payable. Now, this is coming off the books. All right, so that account is now zero. We record the loss on the early extinguishment of the debt for 21.8. We have the discount on bonds payable, also coming off the books, 15,800. That account is now zero, but that's what we want because we're retiring the bonds. And then we pay out the cash for the reacquisition price. So you notice this journal entry looks the same way. This problem is a little bit more involved than the one in the previous video because we had to catch everything up to where we were in time and then do the retirement. But if you look at, you know, starting right here down the rest of the page, it looks just like what we did on the previous page. But the only difference is in this one, we had to do that extra step to catch things up to July 1st. Uh, and then do the retirement entry. So these last two videos give you a pretty good look at uh, retirement of debt. So, you know, you can see it's a little bit more difficult, I think, this problem was. So just make sure you, uh, you know, use that to your advantage, study this, and hopefully it gives you a good example uh, and helps prepare you for your exam uh, whenever you cover this chapter on a test. All right, so this ends our uh, long-term liability chapter. Hopefully uh, the, these videos have been beneficial, helpful for you kind of uh, getting through the material in addition to what you're covering in class. Uh, so if you're joining, I hope you subscribe to the channel. That does help me out. Uh, please share it with your friends. Thanks.